Well, this is a series we haven't seen in a while. Hey y'all, I have another scary story for you guys. And I'm very fucking excited about this one. I don't know if a lot of you will remember, but when I used to do this series, I think this was like at the peak of this series. I feel like you're really low today. I read a story called My Family Has Been Stalked For Four Years, also known as Daughter's Drawings. The author has reached out to me and he actually sent me another one of his stories that I can read today and I'm so fucking excited. I haven't done one of these videos in a long time and honestly, I don't really know why. I think my main reason is because I have read so many incredible no sleep stories on my channel and whenever I go to the no sleep subreddit, I feel like I can't find anything that quite matches the stories that I've already read. I haven't been on no sleep in a long time so I might be completely wrong in saying that. I honestly, I'm probably gonna go stalk the subreddit right after I film this video. And I've been talking to Nick Bodick on and off for the last couple of weeks. I will have all of his information linked down below. You can follow him on Twitter or Instagram at Nick Bodick. He also has a website which is nickbodick.com. But like I said, I'll have all of that linked down below. But right now we are trying to get something to happen for him and we need your guys' help. We're trying to get Daughter's Drawings onto a podcast that does adaptations of famous no sleep stories. So if you guys could tweet, go on Instagram, go on Facebook, tag Q Code Media with the hashtag produce Daughter's Drawings. You can also include Nick Bodick's name and then as well as a link to the story, which I'll have link down below. So if you guys could help us out so we could reach a wider audience with his stories, I mean, that would be fucking awesome. You guys already know I love helping out these authors. I want their work to be seen by a wider audience and I'm already so grateful that they allow me to read their stories on my channel for you guys. So anything we can do to help them succeed, let's fucking do it. I feel like I should also mention this video isn't like sponsored or anything like that. Like he didn't ask if he could sponsor a video of mine. This is something I'm gonna mention in a couple of videos from here forward because it's something that I really want for him. But without further Without further ado, here's another Nick Bodick story called The Fade. Are you familiar with the quote, the best revenge is a life well lived? I'd like to submit another quote in a similar vein. The worst life lived is a life forgotten. Just under a month ago, in the midst of all of the stay-at-home orders, I found myself at the grocery store. As I went down the aisle looking for a certain bag of chips, I saw someone at the end of the aisle, an old friend. I pushed my cart towards Kim, who I hadn't seen since she had moved about an hour away two years prior. As I neared her, she turned towards me and I smiled with a hey Kimmy. She replied with an awkward but polite hi. It took me aback, but I realized I was wearing a protective mask. I pulled it down under my chin and apologized with another smile, to which Kim responded with raised eyebrows and another awkward smile, although this time it was decidedly more annoyed than polite. I. Nick, I said. In truth, there was a time when Kim and I were more than friends, for about four months. There was rarely a night where she didn't spend the night at my house or me at hers. And when we ended, it was as amicable a breakup as I've ever had or seen. I don't say this to brag, but to illustrate two things. For one, there is zero chance that she legitimately, genuinely did not recognize me. And for two, I couldn't think of any reason why she would pretend to not recognize me. We hadn't seen each other or spoken in some time, but our last interactions were positive ones, once again as friends. Kim simply awkwardly looked at me and shook her head. Uh, hi? I, I'm sorry, I thought you were someone else, I replied. Kim chuckled and offered a no problem before grabbing a bag of pretzels, tossing them in her cart and continuing on her way. The encounter left me a little perturbed. I couldn't imagine anything that could have happened over the last two years that would not only make her mad at me, much less entirely act as though she never knew I existed. I went about my day, finished shopping, and went home. I work from home, so my next several days were occupied by projects, for all of which were various deadlines approaching. As I'm sure is the case with many of you reading this, the lockdown has put a significant halt on my social life. Days go by where I don't talk to anyone, instead burying my head in my work and letting my friends and family do the same. That Thursday, I got a call from Ben, my oldest friend. Since he moved in two houses down during second grade, Ben and I have been best friends. There are a few significant memories I have in my life that don't in some way involve him. His call was specifically regarding a hard drive he and I passed back and forth. I put torrented movies on it. He watches them. Once that little piece of business was conducted, I brought up the incident with Kim at the store. Ben simply said it was weird, but that I shouldn't worry about it. The conversation brought to mind a party the three of us had gone to years ago. It was a Halloween party, and around midnight, the owners of the house shut down all the power, turning the lights and the music off. Everybody screamed and shrieked, and in the darkness and confusion, the owner and a few of his friends did a thing 
but they dressed in all black and would walk by and whisper something creepy into people's ears. It was a stunt that was surprisingly effective and a memorable, unique experience. I offhandedly asked Ben about the party in a, ha, remember that one time sort of way. His response? Uh, I don't think I was at that one, man. I remarked that he definitely was, to which he replied that he must have gotten drunk to the point of blacking out that night. I accepted his answer in the moment, because I could feel that no amount of evidence would ever make him believe, or rather, remember. I, however, remember that Ben hardly drank anything that night. That night, we three had taken ecstasy. For those of you who don't know, ecstasy doesn't make you black out, at least in my experience, of which I have plenty. Another time, another life. But that's besides the point. The point, for that matter, is that twice now, there had been instances wherein memories that I was certain were accurate in my head were denied or otherwise disputed. This made me question myself, question my recollection of things, and at the risk of sounding dramatic, question my past. It's a jarring experience, having your sureness of something denied. As surely as you're reading this, that's how sure I was that this woman at the store was my ex and that my best friend had been at that party. The following day, I got up from bed and went to make myself some breakfast. As the French toast cooked and the pan atop my stove, I decided to quickly run back to my room and grab my phone. Only once in my room, I decided to pick up a few things that were scattered about the floor. After that, I figured I would jump in the shower quickly. To get to the point, I had forgotten entirely about the breakfast I had been making only a single minute earlier. It was only when the smoke detector in my kitchen started beeping and blaring that the thought crept back into my head and I ran out to fix the issue dripping wet with a towel around my waist. I needed help. I had a televisit with both my therapist, which was scheduled, as well as my primary doctor, which I called and set up that day. Neither could provide an adequate explanation for what was going on, and both suggested that work was making me stretch myself too thin, stressing me out. I knew that wasn't the case. Things got worse seven days ago. I sent a text to my friend Luke, whose wife had been very sick in recent days, and who was worried they may have caught COVID-19. Hey man, how's Amy doing? Any news? Looks like she's starting to improve. Sorry, who is this? Of course, I immediately thought of the recent incidents. LOL, it's Nick. Nick who? When faced with confusing or upsetting circumstances, the brain will automatically, on a subconscious level, try to rationalize what's happening. Several excuses went through my mind as to why Luke wouldn't recognize that he was talking to me, he got a new phone. He somehow lost all of his numbers. He was just fucking with me. And Nick bought a dipshit. Did you get a new phone or something? And uh, nope. Uh, who do you think you're talking to? Luke, who's married to Amy, hence why I asked about her. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know any Nick Bodics. Amy either. So, are you fucking with me? There's been some weird shit happening to me lately, so if you're being a dick, stop. At that point, I'm pretty sure he blocked my number. I was certain I was losing my mind. I went on Facebook and found that I was no longer friends with Luke or Amy, and I found the same to be true with Ben. Hey man, something really weird is going on. Who is this? I didn't bother responding. At that point, I was sure there was something happening. I called both my therapist and my primary doctor yet again. Both calls began almost identically. I told the receptionist my name and that I needed to set up an appointment with my respective doctors. Each replied with, are you a new patient? To which I said I was not. Both then informed me that I wasn't showing up in their computer. While my primary doctor works in a large clinic, the front desk for my therapist is run by a sole woman, a woman I've gotten to know on a casual level over the last six years of my being a patient. I told her my name again and said I was the comic guy, inside joke but I was met with little more than an awkward, I'm sorry, and an explanation that my therapist wasn't accepting new patients at this time. I hung up the phone after the second call and I screamed into my couch pillow as loud as I could. Then I picked my phone up again and dialed somebody who would have to know me, my mother. When she answered, I asked, do you know who this is? And her reply was, well, you're either a criminal who steals phones and calls other people's moms, or you're my second favorite son. I only have a sister. I breathed a sigh of relief and told her what was going on, from the people forgetting me to the random lapses in memory that had been plaguing me since the breakfast incident. She agreed that it was strange and frightening, but assured me that she knew who I was and that she would never forget, something that did indeed help to calm me down some. 
After we finished talking about the bizarre goings-on happening around me, my mom mentioned that she had been cleaning out the crawl space at her house and found a box of comics from my childhood that she thought I might want to add to my collection I've accumulated during adulthood. I was absolutely interested in doing so, and as such, we planned that I would stop by the following day, which would be four days ago. The following day, I had arrived at my mom's house, a place that for the last lifetime I've simply walked into. That day, the door was locked. I fumbled with my keys and slid the silver one into the deadbolt and I let myself in. Hello, your second favorite son's here. The house was quiet, but my mom's car was in the driveway, so I knew she was home. Mom? I've already called the cops, just leave. I heard my mom's voice call out from the kitchen and just barely caught a glimpse of her as she peeked around the threshold. There wasn't a hint of levity in her voice. Instead, it was a tone that I wasn't sure I'd ever heard before. It was a tone filled with fear, with uncertainty. I, mom? I called out, pulling my safety mask below my chin. My eyes began welling up with tears as the realization dawned on me that the last thing my mother would ever say to me, the me she recognized and she knew, was a lie. It, it's me, your son? My mother's voice shook. I don't have a son. Please leave. The police will be here any minute now. You don't. I started responding, then I looked around. My eyes landed on a collection of pictures and frames sitting atop an end table next to the couch. The same pictures that had been on that end table for years. One of my mom and I when I was a toddler. A similar picture of my mom and younger sister. And a picture of me holding my sister, who was 11 years younger than me, when she was a baby. Only the picture of my mom and sister remained on the end table. On one side of it was my sister's seventh or eighth grade yearbook picture, and the other was a picture of my Uncle Adam holding my sister, not dissimilarly from the way that I was doing so in the picture it had replaced. On the walls were more pictures, none of which featured me. It was as though I'd been erased from the life of the person I loved the most. I, I'm sorry, I, I must have the wrong house. I, I didn't mean to scare you, please, I'm, I'm sorry. I managed to get out as a wave of emotions crashed into me. I hurried out the front door and went to my car, the scourge of defeat overcoming me as I drove back home. To add insult to injury, when I arrived back in my apartment, I unlocked the main door, and while walking past the mail wall where my downstairs neighbor Patricia was checking her mailbox, I said hi and was asked by a neighbor I've known for four years if I was new to the building. I simply ignored her question and trudged upstairs. It's a very painful experience, the feeling of fading away. On a literal level, I've never been afraid of death, but on an existential level, it is perhaps the scariest thing my mind has ever pondered. I think on some level that no person wants to die having left no impact on the world. Such an impact could be as simple as knowing you once made someone's day better, or as complex as dedicating your life to charity work and more. I find it difficult to put into words the feeling of knowing ahead of time that when I die, there will be no impact that was made. There will be no one who acknowledges my death because to the world, it will be as though I was never here. I began writing this two days ago. These things that have happened, they may sound frightening. And when I began documenting them, I truly thought I was experiencing the worst thing I would ever experience. But yesterday it became clear that I hadn't hit that point. Today I went to check Facebook and found that I had been logged out I couldn't remember my password, so I requested a new one, but I was informed that there was no account attached to my email. The same went for my Twitter and my Instagram. I went about creating new accounts on each of them, starting with Facebook. I was unable to recall my birthday. The dominoes toppled from there. This site is the only one that wasn't erased from existence, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. It looks as though I've had some popular posts on this site, but you likely won't recall ever reading them. I can't remember if Nick Bodick is my actual name, or just a username. My own memories of my life are restricted to those that I was smart enough to write down over the last two days, which I've been reading and rereading for 30 hours now. I don't remember if I was the type of person who wanted to leave a mark on the world. All I am certain of is the fact that knowing I will not be doing so is crushing. It's a pain I feel deep in the pit of my stomach. All those life experiences and joys and loves and friends and family and achievements and dreams and aspirations swirling around. 
never again to be reflected upon and yearned and strived for. Because my friends forgot me, my family forgot me. Soon there will be no evidence left of me in this time, no impact made, no imprint left. And after the only remaining testament to my existence is myself, I will forget me. The worst life lived is a life forgotten, but is a life that's been forgotten even a life lived at all? God fucking damn it! I'm gonna say something that I've said a million times but that you guys haven't heard me say in a long time. I don't know how they do it. Like I just, I don't, I genuinely don't know how people sit there and they write something so fucking beautiful. God. Holy shit. And I think I did a pretty good job for being a little bit rusty. I really got into that one. That was really fucking good. And that is like a really weird irrational fear of mine. I have a lot of irrational fears, so don't come at me. I know I say that everything's a fear of mine, but like this is like a genuine irrational fear. I get nervous that like John doesn't exist or like my friends don't actually exist. Like these people won't know me. Like that I've made up our entire relationship, our entire friendship. I don't know, I'm mentally ill. And so this like really hits home for me. I was having this conversation with my sister like a couple weeks ago, I think, that like everything we know is a lie. Like I get nervous that like when I'm talking about John or when I'm like talking about our relationship, the people around me are like, who the fuck is she talking about? Like this doesn't exist. Like John's not a person. Why have we never met him? Or like when I bring him around, I'm just like talking to air. I don't I don't know, I am crazy. If you guys have any stories you want me to read, please send them to me. I actually, I really miss filming these stories. I get really into them and I don't even realize how long I'm filming for. I love reading these stories and I love getting lost in stories. It's weird because I don't read. Like I don't just read casually like in my off time, but I feel like I should start. But I like reading out loud for some reason. Like I could read out loud, like I've done it for hours before. I just, I feel like I can get more lost in a story when I'm able to read it and I'm able to like voice the characters, if that makes sense. I don't know, but I hope that you guys enjoyed. I will have all of Nick Botic's information linked down below, like everything that you could possibly need. I'll also include the information for the podcast down below so you guys can go in. Shout him out. Let's get this done for him. He writes amazing stories and he really does deserve this. Hi, Nick Botic. If you're watching this, I'm sure you're watching this. Hi, I love your stories and I love you. Thank you for sending this story to me so that I could share it with my audience. But that is going to be it for now. I love you guys. I will see you in the next one. Bye.